Uh, so we'll send out the we'll send out the recording as well as the slides uh, following today's session. Everybody uh, should be coming into into the webinar muted. Um, but as I said, we'll have a time or have some time later for uh, for you to come off of mute and share uh, some updates with us. Uh, so we'll be able to, you'll, you'll be able to take yourself off mute at that point. Um, and we welcome everybody or anybody that wants to to join us on camera if you'd like. And then lastly, we'll be using a poll feature uh, later on in the program uh, where you can either enter, uh, sorry, go to a web browser and um, vote that way, or you can do it through your cell phone. Um, and we'll have instructions on how to do so a little bit later on, but just wanted to prepare folks for that uh, coming down the line here. All right, so first, just a little bit about NEEP. I think most folks on the line are familiar with NEEP. But uh, just in case you are not, we are a regional nonprofit organization that's committed to improving energy efficiency and reducing carbon emissions from the building sector uh, in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic region. So we work everywhere from Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, down to DC, Delaware, and West Virginia. Uh, so if you aren't familiar with some of the resources and um, the guidance that we provide, feel free to take a look uh, at meep.org for more information. Um, you know, our, our our focus is really on sharing best practices, developing new resources, and providing direct technical assistance to both cities and states. And, and then also hosting forums such as this uh, to really drive the conversation and uh, provide some thought leadership leadership and some conversation around energy efficiency in some ways. So as a nonprofit, uh, we work on a wide array of projects. Uh, we are very thankful to all the folks that, that fund and support our work. Uh, so we receive funding through a few different avenues, one being our private foundations that you can see on the slide here. Uh, we also receive it from our allies network, or these are our industry partners, private companies that fund our work. And lastly, but not least, our state partners uh, as well. So uh, any of those folks that are joining us on the line today, we greatly appreciate the support uh, to help reduce carbon emissions uh, in the building sector uh, in our work. So thank you very much. All right, so the last kind of housekeeping note here uh, is just a look at today's agenda. So we've broken things down into kind of two um, topical areas, that being schools and communities. So I'm gonna pass things over to Emmy in just a moment to give an update on uh, Northeast CHIPS. Um, then we'll have, hear about some other resources that we've developed on the school side of things. Uh, and then we'll pass it over, or we'll get, we'll get started on some of our communities, uh, broader community initiatives, um, hearing from Chase about our new communities commitments tracker. I'll walk us through CAPI, uh, which is the Community Action Planning for Energy Efficiency resource. And then we'll briefly discuss some of our plans for 2022. And that's where we'll want to uh, start hearing from you all. We've got a couple of polls during that section. And then lastly, uh, some updates from you all. Uh, so if you've got anything uh, at the top of your mind, um, you know, we'd love to hear about that. So this is just a quick slide to indicate um, you know, that we'll have that session later on. If you do have something that you want to share, please let us know right now or you know, throughout the duration of the webinar by just typing into the chat box. Uh, and then when we get to that section, we will take you off mute and you can share that update then. Uh, I will ask that folks keep it somewhat brief to a minute or two, uh, just so we can get to as many folks as possible. Uh, but yeah, if you have anything related to uh, you know, projects that you're working on, whether that's maybe a zero energy school, um, zero energy public building, a new policy or program in your community, or even at the state level that might support community level initiatives. Uh, you know, we'd love to hear about that as well. And I know we have some folks uh, working on kind of a more national level or from, you know, federal agencies. Uh, if, if any of those folks want to chime in about, you know, new, new tools or resources that they might have, uh, we'd be happy to hear that as well. So feel free to type into the chat box and we'll, we'll line some folks up for later on. All right, so with that, we are going to dive right into our school's uh, updates here for you. And with that, I will turn things over to Emmy Luck to provide us some, an update of a resource that she's been hard at work on over the past several months at NEEP. Thanks, John. So I'll give a brief overview of what Northeast Chips is, if no one, if people are not aware of that yet. And then I'll give a brief update on the changes that were made. So if you want to go to the next slide. I'll just start by saying that efficient schools offer many health and resilience benefits like in increased indoor air quality and the ability to shelter safely in place. 
And this intersection of energy efficiency, health, and resilience is present throughout our lives, but often goes unnoticed. In schools, energy efficiency measures in HVAC systems can translate to reduced rates of asthma and other respiratory issues by maintaining healthy indoor air quality and increased productivity thanks to more comfortable environments. And extreme weather events and now pandemics are teaching us the value of resilience and the ability to shelter in place as essential components of a community ecosystem and the spaces that shape our future generations, schools have to be equipped to weather these storms. So to better understand the challenges and opportunities that schools are facing, MEEP leads a regional collaborative focused on improving the health and efficiency of school facilities. This regional peer exchange network has propelled the development of the Northeast Collaborative for High Performance Schools criteria, affectionately called Northeast CHIPS. And NEEP continues to manage Northeast CHIPS on behalf of this regional network to ensure that it's updated regularly and according with regard to climate and educational priorities of our states and communities. And we also work directly with many school districts to provide uh, technical assistance on their goals. And we've cataloged many of these best practices in the Zero Energy Schools Toolkit, which John will talk about later. But the goal of Northeast CHIPS, as I mentioned, is to catalog these best practices to ensure that all students and staff have access to healthy, energy efficient, and productive environments. And with input from regional stakeholders, including architects, engineers, and state agencies, and departments of education, um, we built this criteria that is used by design teams and school districts as a standard for school construction and can also be used for existing facilities doing renovations. Northeast CHIPS is currently used in state-run school building programs in New Hampshire, New York, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. This year, NEEP, or Northeast CHIPS graduated from version 3.2 to 4.0, which entails significant upgrades to some sections, including zero energy capable, biophilic and responsive design, safer schools by design, and low radon, as well as a brand new section. And the version, the new version includes an update of standards from the International Energy Conservation Code, John, if you want to click, uh, the IECC 2015 to IECC 2018, and from ASHRAE standards 62.1 and 90.1 from 2016 to 2019. And if you want to go to the next slide, I will talk about some of the new uh, updates to some of the sections. Well, the first one, the new section, is designed for adaptation and resilience. And this is to encourage practices that plan for changing climate conditions over the building's lifespan and to create schools that serve as sustainable centers of community resilience. Climate change is already contributing to increased overheating and other extreme weather disasters at schools and events that are expected to worsen over the next century. So this criterion outlines components including a climate vulnerability assessment, adaptation and resilience measures, and passive habitability characteristics in order to ensure, ensure the long-term durability. And to further enable community decarbonization, the zero energy capable section provides a whole new compliance pathway that's modeled after the Massachusetts Energy Zero or Massachusetts Easy Code, which was recently developed by NEEP to support the state's goals. And one school district is already planning to use the Massachusetts Easy Code to build a net zero energy school. We updated the biophilic and responsive design section to reflect language from US CHIPS that addresses elements promoting a sense of calmness and well being. This pur the purpose of this section is responsive design to create safe and calming spaces that contribute to a sense of community and to allow students of all abilities, backgrounds, and perspectives to learn together. The section was further updated to describe how breaking down barriers between the natural world and our indoor spaces can improve focus, awareness, social interactions, and well-being. The next one is, was previously titled Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design, and it was renamed Safer Schools by Design. And the entire section was rewritten to shift emphasis from phrases like deterring crime and reducing fear to phrases like increasing visibility and fostering a sense of safety. This simple shift in language to adopt a more positive tone works towards achieving the goal of created, creating more connected communities and updated elements focus on themes of openness and transparency. And lastly, the new uh, low radon section includes more detailed guidance for new and existing schools to build and retrofit with radon reducing materials and testing practices. 
It also provides more context around the negative health impacts of radon exposure and its presence in schools, which I previously was not aware of before updating this criteria. So this is really interesting for me to learn. Radon is a human lung carcinogen and is the largest ex source of radiation exposure and risk to the public, as well as the second leading cause of lung cancer. And before pre presenting guidance, it explains that approximately 20% of schools have high radon and 41% of those schools are located in known high radon areas. It's important to note that the societal factors include influence health risks and like radon exposure and studies have found that exposure may present significant risks to racial minorities and that rates of radon mitigation efforts reflect income and housing disparities. So it's important to address these issues. So we've upgraded all of these sections and more of them to support the health and safety of students and community members at this critical time. And I hope that this was an informative summary of those changes. Back to you, John. Yeah, thank you, Amy. And I think it's just important to note that you know, we at NEEP, uh, while we manage and, and oversee uh, Northeast CHIPS, we rely on a lot of folks that are experts in, you know, these different areas that Emmy just touched upon um, as, you know, the real, uh, the knowledge base for what this criteria uh, should include um, and, and some of the updates that we wanted to make. Um, Emmy, could you give folks a sense of the timing of this? I know uh, it's, it's out now um, and then there's a concurrency period. Uh, can yes. you just explain a little bit about that? Yes, so this version of CHIPS was published a couple of weeks ago, and it, the concurrency period is from August 1st through February 1st. So up till that point, you can still construct a school to CHIPS version 3.2, but um, we're transitioning to 4.0. And then as of that time, all schools using CHIPS should be using 4.0 going forward. Great. Thank you very much, Emmy. And yeah, feel free to type any questions or thoughts that you might have into the chat box. Uh, we'll get to those uh, throughout the webinar here today. Um, so that covers kind of the update to Northeast CHIPS, um, the new version 4.0. Uh, so as Emmy said, it's a design criteria that communities and their design teams can utilize. Uh, but I wanna just take a step back from that for a second uh, and highlight some of the other resources that we have related to schools at NEEP. Um, and the first one I'll touch on the left side and the left side of the screen here, the Zero Energy Schools Toolkit. This one is really focused on uh, supporting community members, folks that might be a part of a school building committee or facility directors or superintendents, whoever that uh, local level champion might be. Um, that's what this resource is, is, is aimed at um, supporting. So just to give you a quick overview of what's included in this toolkit, uh, it starts by covering some of the benefits and the impacts that folks can see uh, from having a zero energy school in their community. So, you know, that's aimed at trying to uh, win, win people over and show that, you know, these building these schools uh, is the right thing to do. It supports the educational priorities of our communities. It supports uh, the environment and, um, you know, helps save the, uh, the local taxpayers' money over the long term as well. Uh, so that's some of that, that data that we tr try to provide uh, within that benefits and impact section. Uh, we also provide some guidance on selecting the, the team that should be a part of this process. So not only internally at the uh, community level, uh, so in terms of you know, who, who from your school district should be involved, uh, but then also looking at selecting the design team and the architect, uh, the OPM and construction, um, um, service providers, you know, who, who, how can these folks uh, be looped into the conversation and how can the community uh, be sure that they're going to uh, deliver a zero energy school as they had hoped. Uh, so we try to provide some questions and some answers, um, some questions that, that communities can ask of their design teams and then some potential answers that they can expect in response to those questions. Uh, so again, really just trying to uh, help the community pick the right um, pick the right team uh, for them. And then uh, lastly, the, the last thing I'll touch on here is uh, the RFP guidance. So the resp uh, request for proposals, um, you know, is a big part of this process for school districts. So we try to make it as simple as possible for folks by supplying them with the information that they or the the specific language that they should have in their uh, their RFP documents. Also, when they go out. Uh, to secure uh, these services, and, you know, they can just kind of plug and play this language that we've provided in, in the toolkit. Uh, so 
That is uh, the Zero Energy Schools Toolkit in a nutshell. Uh, it's an existing resource that can be found on our website. Uh, you can check it out for free. Uh, and it's in, the, it's in our, um, our plans to update it uh, over the course of the next year or so. Uh, so if there are any sections that you think we should build out further, whether that's you know, things on specific technologies or you know, data that we should be collecting, we would love to hear more about that from you all. Um, but I hope that in its, in its uh, state right now, that it's a, a helpful resource for communities that are going to, to build new schools in the near future. And then the next item on the screen here is our, uh, our regional report that we are working on uh, currently uh, this year and plan to publish with it within the next uh, couple of months here. And it's really a framework for state agencies um, and other funding um, mechanisms at the statewide level. So green banks, utility programs, um, this is kind of geared towards those, um, those types of stakeholders. What we wanna be able to do is say, um, you know, here are a set of best practices that we've seen uh, working in different states across the region. Um, this is how we can collectively move the ball forward for zero energy schools uh, within the NEEP region. So we try to um, highlight profiles from each state. So what are, what are the different uh, school construction programs in all of our states that we work within? So 13 different profiles there, and then talking about some of those recommendations. So what, what can we uh, be doing better um, with these programs to, to fund school cool construction projects uh, going forward? Uh, so I won't talk too much about that because uh, it's in the works now and we'll do a future webinar on it. Um, and that should be coming, coming soon. So more to come on that resource. All right, so next we're going to move to the part of our program where we discuss uh, more of our community wide initiatives and for that we will uh, start by taking a look at a, an exciting new uh, tool that Chase has helped to develop uh, and I'm really looking forward to getting people's reactions to this. Uh, so with that I will turn it over to Chase to talk about the Communities Commitment Tracker. Yeah, thank you. So the Communities Commitment Tracker is you can go on to the next slide is this interactive map we have made that is tracking numeric specific greenhouse gas emissions or energy use reduction goals of towns and cities in the region and we just recently published it so it has its own page on our website where you can interact with it and click on these dots and see more information about every town and so far there's about 75 towns and cities on there so if you go to the next slide, we can see an example. So if you click on this particular yellow dot, you'll see that the pretty small town of Maine, of Belfast, Maine, with just under 7,000 people, has committed to carbon neutrality by 2045. And that link uh, shows you where I got that information or more information about their plan, um, kind of the context of that commitment. For this project, we focused on towns and cities that are not big major metropolitan areas. So there are some larger cities in here because their information is really readily available. But, you know, Philadelphia, Boston, New York City, those are not in here because our goal with this was to focus more on towns that might not have a committed energy manager just generally could benefit more from connecting with other towns with similar goals or with NEEP and our resources. Uh, on the next slide, there's another example, which is East Hampton, New York, which is right near where Emmy is. And that's a little bit bigger, you know, almost 22,000 people, and they have committed to net zero emissions across the whole community by 2030. So we've got some really exciting commitments in here. I collected these from climate action plans and resolutions and sustainability programs, but it's definitely not a, an exhaustive list yet. So over time, I'll be continuing to update it. And for this purpose, um, you know, I'll be continuing to search through either towns that are making new commitments, because a lot of these are from 2021, or ones I haven't found yet. But I also created a document where people like you all can add if you know 
your community or town has a commitment or if you you know work with communities you know have a commitment um, i will put that link in the chat and there are a number of columns in there but just fill out you know what you know and um we can fill out the rest so don't worry about that um and then part of continuing to update it will be compiling the contact information for the overseeing bodies you know who is in charge of these commitments who made them who is formalizing plans to actually reach their goals and Part of that is looking toward 2022, like John will talk about later. We're thinking about how we can, you know, leverage contacts with these communities, how we might be able to form cohorts of people with similar goals or help them as like need how we can help them achieve their goals. And then in the more recent term, we are actually just wrapping up this brief on emerging trends for zero energy communities. So here is kind of the outline that we have so far. You know, we're looking at different kinds of community or engagement that towns are doing, uh, the trends for decarbonization of existing buildings, looking at, you know, time of sale ordinances, energy efficiency ordinances for rental properties, and heat smart campaigns and building energy performance standards, all that good stuff. And then we're looking at trends in green zoning and in new construction codes, adoption of stretch codes and other ways to make sure our new buildings are all gonna be really efficient. And we're looking at innovative ideas for workforce development. And finally, where these towns are getting their money for a lot of this work. So, that's kind of the outline of that brief that will be coming out soon. We're looking at equity and how that is involved in every one of those pieces throughout. And I have a blog post that touches on all of this coming out on the NEEP website soon as well. So that is it for that slide. Thank John's you. gonna talk about KP. Yes, before I dive into KP though, I wanted to make one uh, note and really just emphasize the, the point that Chase made. Uh, obviously, doing that community's commitments tracker is a massive undertaking on you know, a regional scale uh, that, that NEEP works on. So we would really appreciate and love the help of uh, you know, submitting your town or you know, any, any towns that you might work with to that uh, Google form that, that Chase linked to. Um, we would really appreciate the assistance there. Uh, and I think you know it's also important to just note that we don't hope to just track these communities. Um, our goal going forward is really to make sure that we're engaging with these communities, uh, supporting the work that they're doing. If they're making these commitments, um, you know, are they making progress towards these goals? Um, what assistance do they need? Those are sort of the, the questions that we're thinking of um, and trying to you know kind of build a network of these communities over time. So that we can, you know, collectively again, kind of move forward uh, as as a region. Um, so that's really kind of the, the purpose of that tracker um, to give us a sense of, you know, what communities are committing to, and you know how we and our partners and you all on the line can help uh, kind of support these efforts. So. Um, as Chase mentioned, I will next talk about the KP tool. Um, so KP stands for Community Action Planning for Energy Efficiency. Uh, and it is this tool that we developed, I think three or four years ago, maybe four years ago. Um, and it's really trying to assist the communities that Chase was talking about, those smaller to mid-sized communities uh, that you know, may, may require a little bit more um, in-depth kind of technical assistance and, and guidance along the way uh, for these types of initiatives. Um, you know, the, the folks that might not have the in-house uh, energy managers, the sustainability manage, managers uh, to, to take on these types of projects. Um, so just a brief overview of what KP is. Uh, it's an interactive online platform uh, designed to help small uh, and medium sized communities, as I said, take on and prioritize uh, actions related to energy efficiency at the local level. Um, so it's really designed to try and overcome three main hurdles. Um, those being 
figuring out where to get started uh, or where to go next within your clean energy journey at the local level. Um, the next one is uh, challenges to really sorting through um, all the information that's out there. Uh, you know, if you're Googling some of this information, how to get started on an energy plan uh, or taking on benchmarking, let's say, there's just a plethora of information out there that can be somewhat daunting uh, for one community member to um, you know, get hold of and, and really figure out what to do from there. So it's trying to overcome that, that hurdle of an overabundance of information. Uh, and then the last piece is it's really trying to help uh, a community member get buy-in across all the key decision makers at the local level by supplying information in a concise and clear manner. Um, you know, we hope that it will uh, it will allow others to kind of easily and, and rapidly understand you know, what needs to be taken on at the local level. So it tries to synthesize that type of information and, and provide it in a clear, straightforward manner. And I'll just note that these were some of the key challenges that we've heard a lot about you know, through our work at NEEP over the years, working with communities, but also through this task force. As you can see, the last bullet or the last item on this screen, um, you know, we worked very closely with a group of stakeholders on this project so that it wasn't just us at NEEP kind of sitting sitting back in our office saying, you know, this is what communities need, but this is what we were really hearing from folks. Uh, so hopefully it was designed in a way that would help um, help those real world examples. So quickly about how it works, um, and it is really a simple tool. Uh, it was in, created to be intentionally simplistic. We wanted it to be uh, user-friendly for a wide array of folks that might be uh, kind of tapping into it, whether that's an energy committee member, a town manager that maybe doesn't, um, you know, isn't familiar with the energy efficiency world, uh, whether it's a, or maybe a facility director, or it could just be an interested citizen, or so on. Um, the user navigates to the KP homepage, where they then click get started, and uh, from there they follow these three simple steps. First, the user will complete a short questionnaire, there's 10 questions that they'll, uh, the tool will guide folks through, get an understanding of what topics are of interest or what the community has already taken on. Um, and that will help kind of generate the, the recommendations that come, come later. So once you complete the short questionnaire, you submit your answers uh, and then you, you generate what we call an action plan. So this outlines some of the key next steps for the community to take and helps you prioritize um, items that, that you should be th thinking about. Uh, so if the community is at the very beginning of their, uh, you know, clean energy journey, let's say, you know, some of the key first steps will be to form an energy committee, uh, to start developing an energy plan, uh, to do some benchmarking of their buildings. Uh, but maybe that com another community is further along in their journey and is interested in, uh, you know, building a new school or uh, developing a green building policy. Uh, KP will provide some some recommendations uh, based on on your responses to that questionnaire uh, within the action plan. And then uh, all the information basically gets uh, built into what we call fact sheets. Um, and these are uh, just short, um, you know, somewhat, some are five pages, some are three, some are a little bit longer, but they're kind of short, uh, tangible uh, pieces of information that uh, provide guidance on, um, you know, how to take on that specific topic. So again, whether it's benchmarking, forming an energy committee, the fact sheet will spell out, you know, how you can do so uh, and what are some of the key steps, who should be involved in that process. Uh, so it really is kind of that, that high level information on how to take on some of these projects. And it's meant to just kind of get, get the process started at the community level. All right. So we, so as I said, we, released the tool uh, a few years ago now, uh, and then at the beginning of this year, finalized an update to what we're calling version 2.0 of KP. Uh, and it's got some exciting new updates um, that I'm jazzed up about and that I hope others will be uh, as well. Um, the first one being user accounts. So previously uh, there was no kind of input of information from the user's perspective. Uh, they didn't have to put in like their name or what community they were representing. Um, but now uh, folks have to create a profile. Uh, and that's not meant for us to you know, share that information with anyone. It's really just for us to better understand you know, who's coming into the tool, what community they're representing. And that also provides us a way to get in touch with that person. Uh, so if they're coming to us from uh, you know, Princeton, New Jersey, let's say, 
um, then we can get back in touch with them and talk about benchmarking or labeling, whatever the topic might be uh, that's of interest for them. Um, so that's, that's one exciting piece. That also helps us track progress. So if we know you're coming from a certain town, we can see if you've actually taken on any initiatives uh, at the local level. So, um, you know, it's help, helpful for us uh, internally at NEEP. Um, we did some stream, streamlining of the fact sheets. So previously there were PDF documents that you had to download. It was a little bit clunky. Now I think it's a little bit uh, simpler for folks there. It's all just uh, built into our website uh, and I think a little bit cleaner and, and nicer looking overall. Um, the other aspect that we upgraded or uh, installed in this version, I guess I should say, are these discussion boards. So that allows any user to, uh, after they generate an action plan, they can start posting to uh, some of these topics. So if they have a question about, um, you know, maybe they're getting pushed back on a benchmarking ordinance that they're hoping to adopt, um, they could ask a question on this forum and say, you know, how have other communities dealt with this? or are there resources out there on this topic? Um, so that then that allows us as NEEPers, uh, as the NEEP team, I should say, to respond back to um, those comments or questions, or we can tap in other uh, kind of industry experts to respond to any community's questions. Um, so that I think is an exciting new feature and one that I would love to uh, get more broadly out there and have, uh, you know, have a broader discussion going uh, on some of these topics. And then the last item that I'll touch on is the development of a, a couple new fact sheets. So earlier this year, we launched one on strategic, electric, strategic electrification. Um, and that's really, again, from the community's perspective, what types of uh, things should they be considering, um, whether that's like air source heat pump initiatives or uh, you know, requiring all electric technologies um, in, in buildings, things of that nature are covered within that fact sheet. Uh, and then we have a new one coming out very soon on uh, community engagement. And that's one that, again, Chase has been working on and we'll cover here in a moment. Uh, but if you're interested in taking a look at the new version of KP, we've linked it on the slide here. Uh, and it's also easily found on our website. Uh, so take a look if you haven't yet. So uh, here's just a, an overview of the different modules. Um, and that basically just means the different topics that we cover within KP. Uh, so I mentioned a couple of these already from some of those foundational steps like creating an energy committee uh, and developing an energy master plan to some more of the advanced topics like strategic electrification or um, you know, dealing with water and wastewater treatment facilities and communities. Uh, so these are all the different areas that KP provides guidance on. Uh, and then we have a couple of planned ones already in the works, uh, that being community engagement. Electric vehicles is another one that we would like to touch on next year and codes and zoning as well. So if you've got any thoughts on topics that you think uh, are really important uh, in community level initiatives that we're missing from our list here, uh, we'd be happy to take those suggestions here or another time as well. So I wanted to give folks a sense of like the type of information we're covering uh, so with that, I will pass it over to Chase to talk about our newest module coming soon. Yeah, thank you. So I was really excited to get to work on this new module on community engagement. And this graphic, which um, was created by Rosa Gonzalez of Facilitating Power, shows the spectrum of community engagement to ownership. So it's kind of visualizing how when people do their planning, to engage their community. It can range from ignoring groups of your community to actually deferring to them. So the questions listed here are questions that we, adopt, we address in the module. So what groups should be included at the table? Why have the perspectives of these groups historically not been included and why is it important that they are? What are some strategies for engaging and building consensus with underrepresented groups? What are some mistakes to avoid? And how can I identify these communities in my area? So the whole module is intended to give concrete tips and resources to people who are planning energy efficiency projects or policies on how to really look at who you're getting input from, look at how you're planning your events and how accessible they are, how inclusive they are, how intentionally 
you are reaching out to communities that have historically been left out of these planning processes, not only because they are disproportionately affected by climate change, but also because they have lived experience that is really valuable and really vital to building solutions that are sustainable and equitable. So this is hopefully is coming out very soon. We're in the very end of final stages of editing it and hopefully it will just lead to more equitable planning and energy efficiency. Yeah, thank you, Chase. And I know, um, you know, I was kind of doing some final review internally. Uh, it was actually uh, uploaded to the site earlier today, and we are just in the final process of like creating the question in KP. Uh, so it should be launched later this week. Um, and look for that if, if you're taking a look at KD, KP uh, later on. Um, so yeah, that's our, our most recent uh, module. Uh, but like I said, please type into the chat box if you have any suggestions on future things that we should be covering within this tool. So with that, we will start to transition out of kind of the updates that the NEAP team is giving. Um, I guess one last thing I should mention before we do that is, uh, you know, in addition to developing all of these resources, uh, Emmy, Chase, and I, and, you know, others on the NEAP team are available for more of kind of direct one-on-one uh, -on -one engagements with, with cities and states. If there are any topics um, that you would like more information about, uh, you know, want to know more specifically about how to develop a zero energy school or you know, what are some of those best practices? We'd be happy to have a conversation with you all uh, or with wh whoever um, after this webinar, you know, at any time. So feel free to get in contact with us uh, about any of those topics. So uh, this last piece here, uh, I just wanted to give folks kind of an, a general update on where we're headed in 2020, 2022. Uh, is it that time of the year to, to really start looking ahead and, and planning for the next year? Um, which we do early and often at NEEP. Um, so I just wanted to share a few thoughts on what we're doing. And then also I have a couple, this is where I have a couple of poll questions. Uh, so I'd love to get some input uh, from folks on the line as well. Uh, so just two, uh, two items that I wanna mention here. Um, Chase talked a lot about the Communities Commitments Tracker and this network that we're trying to build. Um, so in 2022, what I would love to see us do more of is kind of kind of some some cohort models. Um, you know, we've done a lot of one-on-one -on -one technical assistance in the past, but I think this model of bringing you know four or five up to ten communities together uh, to work on one specific project, whether they're trying to develop a zero energy plan for their community or uh, you know working on a, a benchmarking ordinance, whatever the topic might be, uh, you know, related to energy efficiency. I would love for the NEEP team to, to kind of get involved um, in, and bring, bring together uh, a number of communities to advance them all at the same time. So, uh, you know, folks can kind of learn from one another. We can bring in topical experts um, to, to do a webinar or to kind of facilitate a conversation around, uh, you know, how this, this work uh, can be advanced. Um, but that is, that's one area that I think would have a lot of impact um, and really bring the region Kind of along a little bit more quickly and I, and I hope that folks would be interested in that model going forward um, you know I, I don't think it's uh, any type of new idea uh, but maybe for the NEEP team it might be a little bit of a change in, in you know the scope of things that we've done in the past um, so that is one area uh, that we're really thinking about in 2022 and I have a poll question related to that here shortly the other item uh, we are working on uh, a DOE funded project uh, that's focused on benchmarking and building performance standards. And through that project, we're developing uh, what we're calling the Center for Building Performance Standards. So it's really this, this uh, online resource library um, to help policymakers develop and implement uh, a successful building performance standards, so helping them understand uh, you know, what metrics they should be looking at. Um, what, you know, who, who needs to be engaged in the process of developing a performance standard from, you know, building owners to um, local, uh, you know, any, any form of, any type of stakeholder that should be in integrated into that process, um, you know, 
city facilities departments, um, committees within the community. Uh, these are the, the types of types of information that we want to kind of contain within the, the Center for Building Performance Standards. Um, and there's a lot of good information out there already from folks like EPA and DOE uh, that we want to point to within this, this tool itself. Um, and then the other part is we want to be able to help uh, building owners that have to take on projects um, to, to come into compliance with the building performance standard. We want to be able to supply them with information on, say, operational and behavioral changes that they can make in their building uh, to come into compliance with a, a performance standard. Uh, so that's kind of the, the main idea before um, that we have for this Center for Bu Building Performance Standards that we'll be fleshing out a bit uh, more over the next couple of months and then building out uh, in 2022. So those are just two kind of high level ideas that we've been mulling around a bit. Uh, Emmy, I don't know if there's anything that you want to call out specifically that you've been thinking about for 2022 planning. Yeah, I'll just say that I've been working on a report on how to equitably decarbonize the building sector this year, and we are identifying multiple avenues for further research. And I just want to note that if anyone has any areas that they'd like to see me dive into on equity research, we would love to hear that feedback. So please let us know. Great. Thank you, Amy. All right. So with that, I've launched the first poll. Uh, so you've got a couple of options for responding to this poll. You can either go to pollev.com slash NEEP121, or you can do it uh, through your, your mobile phone uh, by texting NEEP121 to the number 22333, and then you can respond uh, with your selection here. Uh, so again, you can either do it via text message or uh, through your internet browser. Um, hopefully, that will, I think we should be activated here. So uh, yeah, the question is, from your perspective, um, what, what things should we focus on in 2022? Uh, and this is more of like, what activity should we be focused on rather than topics specifically? Um, and yeah, okay, good. So it looks like, looks like it is activated. Um, yeah, and we mentioned a little bit about, you know, these cohort models that we're thinking of. Uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one direct technical assistance is something that we've always historically provided uh, to cities and states. Uh, you know, should we continue on with the research and, and development of reports? Uh, you know, I think that's something that we will always kind of naturally do. Um, but yeah, curious from, from the uh, audience's perspective, what would be of most value uh, to you all? Answers coming in now. Glad to see some of those some folks responding about the cohort model. I think that would be uh, something of great interest. Looks like we've got somebody drawing on the screen a little bit maybe here. <laughs> the beauty of Zoom. All right. That yeah, looks like cohort models are kind of taking the cake here, which is which is good to see and um, you know, we're right in this process now of developing our project briefs and figuring out what we want to work on. So just just having this information, um, you know, will be helpful to take back to the team and say that this is what people, um, this is what our stakeholders are interested in. So, all right, awesome. With that, we will move on to the next one. Great. So this is. Uh, our next poll, and you can respond uh, the same way that you did for that last one, either on your browser, pollev.com slash NEEP121, or text NEEP121 to 22333. Instructions are at the top there. Uh, so yeah, what topics are most interest to you? So this is getting more into the specifics about you know what, what topical areas we should cover, um, whether it's through research and reports, through the technical assistance, through the cohorts, whatever it might be. Um, Curious to hear, uh, you know, what, what's on the top of mind for you all. all right. so it looks like benchmarking, labeling, performance standards are kind of the, the big one here, and that certainly tracks with what we've been seeing over the course of this year. Um, so benchmarking uh, in NEEP terms, that's more focused on commercial and public buildings. Uh, labeling speaks to home energy labeling programs that we've seen a lot of interest from smaller communities on this year. 
Um, and of course, performance standards talk about regulating uh, emissions or energy usage in, in building and in existing buildings. It looks like there's a fair amount of interest in both uh, the new construction, all electric and public building side, and then on the existing building side for labeling, benchmarking and performance standards. Awesome. All right, well, that is helpful to see. Thank you very much for everyone's responses to that. Skipped ahead one too many there. All right, so now we've got a few minutes. Uh, we can probably take 10 plus minutes uh, for any updates that folks have on the line here today. Um, so I don't know if we had anybody chat in saying that they wanted to give an update, uh, but now would be a great time to do so if you haven't yet, uh, or feel free to take yourself off of mute and uh, you know jump in about any, any projects that you wanna update the group on. If you have any questions, have any thoughts on 2022, you know, we'd love to hear that and take some feedback. John, while we're waiting for anyone to provide an update, I can just provide a brief um, answer to one of the questions that we've received in oh, the awesome. chat earlier yes. about Northeast chips. And Carl uh, mentioned that some of the uh, standards are moving towards 2021 IECC rather than staying with 2018. And I just wanted to note that we made the decision to stick with 2018 because not all of our states are yet on the 2021. And um, because there are compliance options in Northeast chips that encourage uh, further meeting more than just the base code. So there are uh, more available points for meeting, for strengthening your, the, the code. So just wanted to make that note. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you know, we always have the option too of uh, doing like state specific addendums if, uh, you know, we want to get into that discussion we can certainly do that and require uh you know things on a, on a statewide level as well within northeast chips so it's always an option as well all right i saw a couple of people let me just open up the chat here so a couple of people typed in um, Yes, Susan from Mass CEC, if you want to come off of mute and speak to your update, you're welcome to do so, or people can check out the chat. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Yeah, this is Susan. I'm the marketing director at Mass CEC, Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. And I just wanted to make the group aware that for the last year or so, we've been assembling a website that is consumer facing and that helps residents uh, understand their clean energy choices for their home. So in the case that they are replacing their heating system or thinking about their electricity supply, we want to be there to help them make choices that are cleaner if possible. So the website, uh, it basically focuses on Massachusetts residents, but a lot of the resources there would apply to any state that's looking to uh, you know, engage their, their residents in that same way. Um, so I, I guess I just wanted to publicize that our site is out there. And if you see anything on the site that you wanna customize for your own use, feel free to get in touch with us. Um, or if you have you know, ideas, something your community is doing uh, in a resident facing way that you think you know, we should be uh, using on, on goclean.massiec.com, we'd be happy to hear your feedback as well. Thank you, Susan. We will share that around, or it looks like you already did in the chat. So yep. uh, we'll take a look as well. Thank you. I just saw uh, another comment come in about any data uh, related to building energy use trends uh, during or related to COVID, um, which I think is uh, definitely an interesting topic. I've seen it on kind of an individual city level. Um, and specifically in a community that we're working with, it's doing some voluntary benchmarking with commercial building owners. Um, I've seen some data like on that level, but nothing on more of a, you know, regional or state, uh, you know, more of like a trends level, I think would be interesting to see how, how COVID has impacted things. Um, so I will, Joanne, keep an eye out for that. Um, I think, you know, I'm sure there'll be more coming out. Um, 
on that topic. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if anybody else has seen any data, energy data trends related to COVID. If you have anything to share on that, please feel free to jump in. All right. Well, I think we can move on unless folks have any uh, last minute items that they want to share with the group. Um, and we've just got a couple of events that we wanted to make people aware of. Uh, and then also, um, yeah, I think actually that this might have been the last one. But yeah, just so folks are aware, uh, we have our upcoming Deep Summit um, in under a month now, uh, coming into September on reimagining and rebuilding communities. Uh, so this is a virtual event uh, that's taking place um, without slides, actually. So we're, we're doing it uh, in a fashion that folks can just listen in while they're doing other work, while um, you know, going for a walk, whatever it might be. Just trying to recognize that folks want to get out from behind the screen uh, and and listen to some good, um, you know, content about uh, community level energy efficiency. Um, so that's happening to, uh, September 20th to the 22nd. Take a look uh, at our website for more information and to register for that event. Uh, the next one is um, Nessie's Building Energy uh, New York City uh, conference coming up uh, at the end of September. So just following the NEEP Summit um, at, uh, I guess we have a virtual workshop at 1 p.m. Uh, is that the one that you're leading, Emmy? Yeah, yeah, I'll just throw in a quick plug for that. It is a free and virtual workshop at the conference. So you don't have to purchase a ticket to the conference or show up in person to attend. So I think that's a that's a great part of it. And also it's going to be very interactive. We're also not gonna have slides and it's going to be a collaborative problem solving model, which should be really fun to actually dig into some kind of fake issues based on real life scenarios and kind of get your hands dirty with the, the policy process and see what you can accomplish. So join us there. Awesome. Thank you, Emmy. Yeah, and the next one I want to mention is a three part webinar series that we are launching in, starting in October. Uh, and this, uh, the focus of this webinar series is really on existing buildings. So it'll be broken down into uh, residential, commercial, and then some more uh, like utility program or innovative program type of strategies for that December uh, webinar. Um, so again, that one's focused on strategies for existing buildings. Um, we'll send out more information about that as it gets a little bit closer. Um, and then just two others a little bit later this year, the MBI Getting to Zero conference in October, as well as the ACEEE Energy Efficiency as a Resource. So all great forums, uh, feel free to Take a look, um, you know, at this slide for for links and more information. But with that, I think those are all the updates that we wanted to give. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, this is informational about some of the resources that we have at NEEP and um, you know some of the things that we're thinking about for next year. Please uh, feel free to get in touch with either Emmy Chase or myself um, at any point. Uh, yeah, we're happy to continue the conversation. Uh, but thanks again. I hope everyone uh, stays well and have a good day. Thank you.